In this final lecture for the week and for the course, I'm going to look at how interest groups lobby the American people. Most of this class has been spent examining the interest group struggle and interest group actions within the sort of what we could think of as capital P official political world, the directly political activities uh, that go into achieving the goals of organized interest groups, which is to get their preferred policy outcomes enacted or, in the case of playing defense, preserved. For this final lecture, I'm going to look at something that's also an important component of interest group activity, but it's really an indirect way that interest groups go about getting what they want. Because what interest groups want can be gotten through the political system, through uh, lobbying legislatures, executives, and the judiciary, uh, and obviously electoral politics, as you can see from the diagram, is a primary uh, component of the political system. The diagram today draws back on a diagram from week one, and I've just I've highlighted different parts of it and then added some pieces to uh, uh, connect the material from today with the material from the beginning. But this is going to round out the consideration of what it is that interest groups are doing. Ultimately, interest groups are pursuing policies that uh, will benefit their members. And whether that benefit is a material benefit or an ideological benefit depends on the nature of the group. And often it's going to be a mixture of the two. Uh, there is going to be a relative level of success. Some groups are going to get uh, all of their preferred policies. Actually, that's, no one gets all of their preferred policies. Some groups are going to get more of their preferred policies than others. Uh, even when you get your preferred policy, you may get a sort of watered down or uh, partial version of it. Um, there are relative levels of winning in uh, the interest group struggle. And of course, as I talked about last time, the struggle can also include collaboration and cooperation, though it does take place in a broader uh, struggle between interest groups for uh, outcomes that are almost always going to benefit some and are going to go against others. Lobbying the American people is different than lobbying legislatures, executives, and the judiciary. And of course, lobbying the legislature is different than lobbying executive uh, appointees or executive uh, elected officials, and lobbying the judiciary is different than uh, lobbying either of the political branches, as you should be able to be, as you should know at this point, you should be able to talk about pretty easily. That was my phone ringing because I forgot to turn off my phone. Uh, so back to the lecture. Um, the lob lobbying the American people is a yet again a fourth different kind of activity, and its purpose is more indirect. Um, public opinion is the target of lobbying the American people. Uh, and when I say the American people, it might not be the American people. It might be the people of the state of Oregon. It might be the people of the state of New York, or it might be the people of uh, Detroit or Atlanta or of the Southeast. So uh, the it can be some subset of the overall American people. But the uh, public opinion is the target. And public opinion has a, an, a, a, an impact on the political environment. Though, as I say in the notes here, it's an amorphous impact. Um, when, let's say, you are successful as an interest group in getting the public to be outraged by a problem that your group wants to uh, have change through the political system. Uh, for example, to use a germane example, uh, when you want to get the public to be outraged by uh, systemic racism and by racism in policing and by the way in which police departments are funded and trained and uh, um, overseen uh, and, and police officers are either uh, approved or punished, when you want a change, when you when you uh, want a change in policy, getting outrage in public opinion can be a component of achieving that victory. But it is amorphous because one of the things about uh, elected officials and appointed officials is that they are not directly responsible to the public. They are 
responsible to, in the case of elected officials, their constituents. And when we're looking at legislative uh, elected officials, their constituents are a subset of the overall people. Um, so if you're elected to a state Senate seat in the state of Oregon, you are uh, responsible to an electorate, a constituency of about 50,000 people, which is, uh, you know, one thirtieth of the entire population of the state of Oregon. So you are not going to necessarily take your cues from public opinion in the state of Oregon. Uh, as an executive uh, uh, elected official, you're much more likely to take into account public opinion because public opinion uh, matches onto your constituency. The opinion of people in Oregon is the opinion of the constituency of the governor of Oregon. The opinion of the people of the United States is the constituency of the president of the United States. So executive uh, elected officials are going to, to pay closer attention to, though, uh, because public opinion occurs across so many different issues uh, and because executives themselves have their own agendas that they're pursuing and that they're seeking to uh, maintain not just the support of the people in general, but of their supporters, the, the funders, the donors, the activists, and the voters that are likely to reelect them if they in fact have uh, the possibility of being reelected if they haven't been termed out. So even there where there's sort of the most direct linkage between public opinion and the constituency of an elected official, there's going to be a disjointed connection. And certainly when we're talking about appointees of either the executive or the judicial type, public opinion, particularly for judicial appointees, is a remote consideration, not a direct consideration. Um, so there is some uh, kind of fall off between lobbying the American people and uh, what ends up being policy outcomes. Why lobby the American people? Why attempt to impact the political environment? Well, the political environment is the environment in which the uh, policymakers make their choices. And even if there's not a direct connection between public opinion on an issue like, say, gun control, which usually spikes after a mass shooting of some kind in support for gum, uh, gun regulations, even if they're very, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, small ones like bump, banning bump stocks, uh, which is just one kind of uh, um, accoutrement for a gun, there's, there's a spike in public support for a policy like that that doesn't always, and in this case didn't, translate into a policy outcome. But the political environment is the environment in which people operating within the capital P political system, policymakers of either the elected or the appointed type, are making their decisions. And so it can't not have an impact on them. Right? You might decide that you don't really care about the weather, um, that if it's raining, you're going to not carry an umbrella or wear a raincoat or necessarily wear a hat. But the weather, even if you eschew the weather, is going to have an impact because if it's 95 degrees or if it's 55 degrees, even if you say, ah, I'm not going to pay attention to the weather, the weather is going to impact the decisions on what kinds of clothing that you're going to wear. The same thing is true. I hope this is not a strained metaphor, but the same thing is true for the political environment. Uh, elected officials can ignore the dictates of public opinion uh, in their specific form, but the overall political weather is going to impact the uh, way in which um, they make their decisions. Now, this is, I would say, particularly uh, true in a kind of an indirect but important way for executive appointees, which is this. Um, as you recall, the partisan lean of the administration is a very important component for what kind of lobbying is going to go on and what kinds of lobbying is going to be successful, what sorts of policy outcomes from the executive branch are going to obtain. And the political environment is extremely important for who gets elected to these executive positions. It's way more important for who gets elected to executive positions than who gets elected uh, to legislative positions because legislators are elected by a smaller constituency. Um, executives are elected by the broader constituency, either the statewide constituency or the national constituency. And so the political environment for executive elections is, I would say, the area where there's the tightest linkage. So, for example... If you would prefer to have a Democratic administration over a Republican administration, you personally or interest groups that you're aligned with would prefer to have a Democratic administration, then the 
political environment running up to the next presidential election, which will have a big impact on who wins the presidency, is going to be important. And so as a pro-democratic leaning organization, you're going to want to make the political environment for a Republican incumbent look bad, seem bad, feel bad. Um, and uh, this might be an, uh, a, a circumstance in which working on the overall political environment is going to be more effective than normal. Um, so, for example, during the midterms, uh, you know, prior to a the 2018 election, uh, it's helpful if you wanted to flip Congress from being Republican controlled to being Democratic controlled to message and push and lobby the American people to see things as not being done run well by the ins by the Republicans. Um, but because every individual legislator in Congress is running in a specific state or district, that overall change in the political environment is not going to have as direct an impact as if you can, during a presidential election year, make it seem like the Republican administration is doing a disastrous job. Or on the flip side, if you if having a Republican administration benefits you personally or as an interest group that you represent or work for, uh, you're going to want the political environment to be uh, as hospitable for the incumbent as possible. Uh, so in a, and the same thing goes uh, actually operates at the state level because people are pretty aware of uh, the political environment in their states, and that is uh, very important for whether a Democrat or a Republican gets elected to uh, statewide office to gubernatorial uh, positions. So in that particular case, while there is still an indirect connection between changes in public opinion and the actions of uh, executive policymakers, there is, I would say, the tightest linkage uh, available. Um, the weakest linkage for, between the political environment uh, and policymaking is in the judiciary, and this is because of the lifetime appointments of federal uh, judges, and even in states where judges are elected uh, instead of appointed, they're typically elected to long terms, like 8, 10, and 12 years. And also, they tend to be elected in nonpartisan elections, uh, and incumbents have a huge advantage in these. And so, they don't basically, judges running for re election don't need to pay so much attention to uh, the state of the political environment or definitely public opinion on particular issues, so much as just maintain their character uh, and uh, show that they are still abiding by the rule of law, that they're being fair. Judicial elections have a different type of tenor to them than uh, elections for the legislature or the executive. And the political environment matters a little bit, of course, but it matters way less than it would matter in an election for a legislator or an executive position. So if you are interested in achieving policy victories through the judiciary, you have less interest in impacting the political environment. So if your policy goals can be achieved through executive action, either offense or defense, uh, and you have a policy, set of policies that do have a, you know, a partisan lean to them, that you would be better off with a Democratic administration or a Republican administration, then as executive elections approach, it's going to be more compelling to begin lobbying the American people or the people of Oregon or the people of Texas or the people of Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or whatever uh, position you're looking at than it would normally be. Now, that is, again, not to say that interest groups don't attempt to engage in lobbying the American people as a kind of a helper to their other lobbying activities, but that's really what it is, is it's, is it's a helper. It's creating the conditions that make it easier to do the official, directly political lobbying that results in uh, um, getting policies. Also, as I've implied here, that makes it easier to get the right kind of people elected. Um, so if you have policies that are fit what a Republican legislator is likely to push for or vote for or against, you're obviously having to have an interest in the electoral environment before legislative elections, um, making things beneficial for Republicans, um, just like for particularly in executive elections. But it really it, it is it's more about the fact that it's uh, creating an, a hospitable political environment is an indirect aid. You're attempting to influence the weather now. I use that metaphor again because I, it also is that uh, it's attempting to change the political environment through interest group uh, activity, through lobbying the American people, is a little bit like trying to influence the weather, which is uh, to say that it's a big and difficult thing to move. But it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. 
And how does it happen? Well, uh, I've, I've uh, elaborated on the notes from week one um, with a few of the primary methods by which interest groups go about attempting to influence public opinion. There's direct communication with members, and this is actually a, an, an, a very effective way of getting members' opinion to move. And the larger your membership, the bigger impact that's going to have on public opinion. Interest groups have, uh, as a matter of course, usually very effective ways of directly communicating with their members through their YouTube channel, their websites, their newsletters, which often now point to articles on their website, blog posts, um, as well as the YouTube channel or other social media channels. Um, so direct communication with members is actually, uh, of all these methods, a very effective way of getting a movement in public opinion, at least insofar as the members of that group are part of the public and members of that group can be moved uh, very effectively in one direction or the other. This is where numbers matter an awful lot. The, the larger your group's membership, the more impact direct communication can have on the overall public opinion. And this is where uh, numbers win over money because it doesn't take that much money to directly communicate with your members. In fact, it's one of the most cost-effective ways of having an impact on the political environment is uh, establishing a widely read newsletter or other form of communication. Um, many large uh, interest groups have a legislative scorecard that uh, in, in, what they do is every legislator in the country, every member of Congress and every member of every state legislature is uh, scored based on that group's metrics. So, for example, the National Rifle Association scores it on gun rights. Uh, um, the uh, NAACP scores it on support for uh, uh, minority rights. Um, the ACLU uh, scores it on support for civil liberties. Whatever that group's concern is, they score legislators and send out those scores. And often they will then also score uh, potential uh, challengers, people who are running for positions, though those people don't necessarily always have something that's easily scorable. But a legislative scorecard is a relatively inexpensive way of communicating directly and influencing public opinion about particular office holders, which then has, in this case, a direct impact on electoral politics. So the larger your membership, the more your legislative scorecard is going to have an impact on that particular election. Um, free media uh, is actually also a very uh, in, you know, popular and important way of influencing public opinion because one, it's free, so it, it costs very little resources. It doesn't cost zero resources because you still have to have the connections and you have to dedicate the time to getting someone to do the media and you have to then uh, spend time preparing. So it's not a completely free, resource cost free process, but um, it is uh, really low down there in terms of the organization's resources being used. It's also one of the more effective ones because people tend to be less guarded about blocking messages that come through free media than they do for messages that come through paid media. Um, but paid media is another outlet, another option, and uh, organized interest groups will advertise, sometimes directly for and against candidates, but they will also often just have issue advocacy or just basic uh, you know, ads about the environment, the, the, the political environment. So if you want uh, Donald Trump to lose re-election, you could run a series of ads directly against Donald Trump, um, and that's what Citizens United makes available to interest groups now. Or if you just want to create an inhospitable political environment for the incumbent, uh, you can run ads that just talk about how America's a mess and people are worse off, and you don't directly have to attack uh, the incumbent president to have that kind of uh, that kind of effect on the political environment, and in fact, it might be more effective to uh, you know make the political environment seem terrible than it is to directly attack uh, the incumbent president. And there there are you know there's sort of both an art and a science to uh, changing the uh, political environment for the re-election of an incumbent governor or president. But paid media people will tend to be more guarded against it because they know that the purpose of the advertisement is to get them to form a particular opinion, and people don't necessarily want to be told by television or Facebook or radio or print ads what to think. So free media will be more effective because it kind of it gets behind people's defenses more 
effectively. Now, uh, over on the other side of the diagram, I have protests and demonstrations, and protests and demonstrations are um, ways to use free media to, to get a broader message. Free media, uh, you know, could be things like somebody goes on a talk show, or somebody goes on, to, talks to a journalist, or somebody goes on a podcast. That's, those are all free media. Free media is also journalistic coverage of events. So if your organization is sponsoring a protest, like a Black Lives Matter protest, and that protest gets picked up on, uh, you know, various media outlets, that's free media that's connected to protests and demonstrations. Protests and demonstrations also, even when they don't have wide audiences in the media, they do have a more local audience. People see them in real time, not just in mediated time. They see them in on the ground. And that is actually for certain kinds of uh, actions, for certain kinds of movement, that is more effective. You know, if, if you want to, for example, get your city council to adopt a new policy, um, and you hold a demonstration where a lot of people in the community see it, hear it, respond to it, uh, and themselves uh, take it upon themselves to pressure the city council, that's going to be more effective than something that gets picked up on the nightly news necessarily or something that uh, you know just has this kind of uh, very symbolic nature to it. So uh, not to say that, that protests that get picked up on the mainstream media are just symbolic and get largely ignored by policymakers, but... Uh, things that don't get seen by a giant audience don't necessarily have no impact. So protests and demonstrations can be a direct way to get people who see them or who experience them or who hear about them through word of mouth and don't necessarily uh, see the official media coverage of them to change their minds or to, inc to increase their outrage or to increase their support for a particular policy. But protests and demonstrations are often connected with uh, free media. Now, grassroots work in education is also a way, this is one way to directly communicate with members, but it's also a way of directly communicating with non-members. Um, and this is where you get out into the community. And, you know, grassroots work and education can be uh, door knocking. It can be uh, pamphleteering at the local grocery store or mall. It can be holding seminars and classes. Uh, it can be having free events. Um, uh, protests and demonstrations are obviously also part of and connected to the idea of grassroots work and education. Uh, protests have an educational uh, function as well as a, uh, a protest function. So these methods are kind of all connected to each other. They're not, you know, they're, they're not identical, but they're, they have strong connections. Um, and what they are all intended to do is they're intended to get people in the public to have certain attitudes and dispositions, and more importantly, to get to have an issue at a high level of priority. And that's the biggest thing. It's not about convincing people necessarily to side with your policy or to support the thing that you want to support. You know, most parents are going to support more funding for uh, public education. Um, and so drumming up greater level of support for for public fund, public education funding isn't necessarily necessary, but many parents don't have that as a priority. Many parents would prefer low taxes over greater funding, and so uh, your cause, while it has their support, has a lower priority, or when there's a trade-off, it's going to be traded off against something that has, has a higher priority. So working on public opinion is partly about shaping people's minds. It's partly about getting them to adopt your view and your position, but in a broader way, it's about increasing the uh, attention, increasing the emotional intensity, moving an issue up the agenda uh, list to the to a higher position so that people actually don't just support you, but they care. They don't just say, yeah, I hope you win, but I'm going to vote or donate or uh, dedicate my energy to your particular cause. That's where uh, lobbying the American people is more directly connected to essentially marshalling resources for a uh, an interest group to do its more directly political activities. If people are more outraged about a particular issue that is uh, one of the issues that your organization supports. Let's say you're part of an organization that supports greater racial justice in policing. Um, the, you know, people don't necessarily want racist policing, but how much outrage, how much concern, how high on the priority list of addressing this problem was it for most people? Not very high. Um, 
the weeks and now months on end of protests and demonstrations and free media and also direct communication and grassroots work uh, and even paid media, all of the uh, uh, methods of uh, working on uh, public opinion, of lobbying the American people are being utilized in this particular case. Now, people who supported your position before, yeah, police departments shouldn't be racist, um, are now actually willing to demand change, to write letters, to go themselves to a demonstration, to vote with this at the top of their mind, to talk about it, to, de- to, to uh, volunteer with, uh, for one of these organizations, to donate money. Um, so to help marshal resources to get these organizations uh, leg up in the process of lobbying uh, the uh, uh, um, lobbying uh, policymakers to adopt reforms that will improve uh, racial justice in our policing system and in our society as a whole. So in a way, lobbying the American people is connected back to what's a fundamental activity of interest groups, which is marshalling resources, because the more resources that you have as a group, uh, the more likely you are to gain success. Now, of course, you have to use those resources effectively and efficiently. You can't squander them. You can't spend more resources generating new resources than you are able to uh, 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 use to influence the policymaking process. You can move backwards. You can generate a lot of resources, but you can use so much energy, time, and money generating those resources that you're actually worse off than you would have been if you just kept doing things the way you were doing them before. And this is one of the uh, one of the dangers of any kind of lobbying of the American people is it can become an end in itself that doesn't end up improving the ability of the interest groups that want policy changes to actually achieve those changes. This is where this, you know, playing defense is relatively easy. You can, you know, uh, there's after a mass shooting, there's always a lot of outrage, a lot of concern, a high priority for about gun control and about mental health in uh, the American people. But um, that is essentially doesn't translate into policy changes because organizations like the NRA, uh, they don't necessarily succeed at uh, getting rid of that outrage. They just succeed at making that outrage not translate into concrete political action within the political arena um, that will that is the necessary uh, um, factor in achieving success and getting policy changes. Um, and it is always easier to play defense for a lot of reasons, and one of them is that even when you get public opinion behind you, and even when you generate a lot of concern, a lot of outrage, a lot of energy, a lot of resources, um, if that activity is more of an end in itself and doesn't then uh, move into the official political arena, then you're not going to get the policies that you want. So for example, for, for the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, um, groups and for these protests against racial injustice, the important step is not just to convince Americans that there's systemic racism. It's not just to get people outraged about it. It's not just to keep it at the front of our minds and to make it a top priority for our society. It's to then move into the political arena and have policy proposals, uh, get involved in doing those kinds of lobbying activities that are going to actually have there be changes to getting people elected who don't just support uh, greater racial justice, who don't just support uh, better oversight for police departments and defunding the militarization of police departments and increasing funding for mental health, all of these uh, ideas, but who are in fact going to do it. So there's a sustained attention that's necessary uh, as well. So uh, lobbying the American people is one, to summarize, it's one, it's indirect, um, it works on the political environment, and you work on the political environment so that you can have an easier time succeeding within the political system, so that your electoral activities and your lobbying activities are more likely to be successful. And it's ultimately your lobbying activities that uh, is the aim of an interest group. Um, it's also the case that um, lobbying the American people is, is about not just changing the political environment, but about generating resources that will help organizations function within the political arena, uh, generating more money. Definitely Black Lives Matter groups, uh, civil liberties groups are getting more donations right now than they were getting six months ago. Um, and that it, that is going to help them do their work much more effectively. Um, there's more activists. There are more people volunteering. There are more people who are going to write letters. There are more people who are going to vote based on uh, um, issues of uh, racial injustice uh, in 2020 then voted for issues of racial injustice in 2018 and in past years because of these greater resources. So lobbying the American people is in a fundamental way about generating resources 
and also moving the needle in the political environment. But both of those are aimed at the thing that interest group activity is aimed at in our political system, which is getting policy victories. And I think that's an excellent way to end this course. And I hope that you learned an awful lot about how interest groups function in the American political system.